Okay, thanks, Matt. Um, so uh, today I'll be talking about some transcendence uh, results which are related to uh, modular functions, so are related to the objects I introduced yesterday. And I wanted to begin with some remarks that have a very large intersection with Lecture 3 of Professor Volschmidt. So, um, and that's that a lot of the classical transcendence results that you will see in his lectures are consequences of, um, can be viewed as consequences of the simplest case of the schneider lane theorem. So I just want to uh, briefly go over uh, what that is. So, um, so I first have to define a notion of uh, the order of growth of an entire function. So if we have an entire function, or holomorphic function. Uh, so I'm just considering functions on, uh, uh, on the complex, um, complex plane. And rho is a real number, positive real number. Then um, f is said to be of order at most rho, so order less than or equal to rho, if for all r sufficiently, if, if there is a constant, sorry, such that for all r sufficiently large, the maximum modulus of f on uh, the disk of radius r is bounded above by this constant times r to the row. So, for example, if the um, exponential function has uh, order 1, the uh, Weierstrass elliptic functions have order 2, except, of course, they're not entire. So I have to say for a meromorphic function, uh, you look at it as a ratio of entire functions. And uh, its order of growth is the order of growth of the, of the numerator and the denominator, so the, the maximum of those. Okay, so um, the theorem So if you have a, a number field and n uh, functions which are uh, of order at most rows, so order less than or equal to rho, so they're um, meromorphic functions, and uh, then you look at the field uh, that they generate. And you ask that it have transcendence degree at least two. So that means that there, there, is, uh, there is going to be two of these functions which are algebraically independent. Okay. And then uh, you assume that the ring that they generate is stable under differentiation. And then the remarkable thing is that you can then say that there are only finitely uh, complex numbers W such that the Fi evaluated at W all take values in K. So that's the qualitative statement. Actually, uh, the proof gives you a quantitative statement. It gives you an, up, an upper bound for that finitely many of the form um, some constant um, times the order of growth times the degree of the field. And um, uh, as Matt pointed out in the lecture at AM, um, this constant is wrong in Lang's book, uh, but it's, it's small. It's like I don't know, it's 20 or 20 or something like that. Yeah. It's 20 or 10 or something like that. But, um, so it's, it's a small number. So, uh, so let's do one example, actually, which uh, isn't, isn't in my notes. I think it's in the, um, in the appendix. So let's look at uh, the example where F1Z is Z and F2Z is is e to the z. So um, these are uh, growth rate order less than or equal to 1, and um, they're uh, algebraically independent functions, as it's easy to see. And the ring that they generate is certainly stable under differentiation. 
So suppose you have an algebraic number not equal to zero, and you want to show, so alpha algebraic, and you want to show that e to the alpha is transcendental, then as usual in transcendence proofs, you assume it's algebraic and you derive a contradiction. So if this is algebraic, then you're going to be able to look at this field, which is a number field. And um, then uh, this is the sort of the setup of the um, schneider lang theorem. So then the schneider lang result will tell you uh, that there are only finitely many values at which z and e to the z can be um, can be in k. So if you look at the points uh, z equal to m alpha as m runs over the integers, then um, f1 of m alpha is equal to m alpha, uh, f2 of m alpha is equal to e to the m alpha, which is equal to e to the alpha to the m. So these numbers are in the number field k and there are infinitely many. So this is a contradiction. So something that you assumed is false, in particular, um, you have this. And so uh, there are lots of different uh, pairs of functions to which, well, you can use more than a pair, but uh, um, uh, there are different uh, sets of functions to which you can apply this. For example, if you apply it to f1 z equals um, e to the z and f2 z equals e to the beta z for beta algebraic and irrational. And you look at the points m log alpha, you get uh, that alpha to the beta is transcendental for alpha algebraic alpha not equal to 0 and 1. So um, I had actually uh, not intended to uh, do this because I thought it would be in um, Michelle's lectures, but he tells me that he didn't uh, actually uh, do this, so I'm going to do it and uh, skip something else. So this is really um, a good example of cutting a long story short. I'm going to give a summary of the proof of the schneider lang which is qualitative and is cutting a very long story short. So the idea of the proof. So for all of the uh, constant is wrong, uh, it's actually nicely explained in, in Lang's book on transcendental functions. So take two functions f and g, which are algebraically independent, so amongst your um, n functions. Then what you do is you make an auxiliary construction, so you look at a polynomial in f and g, so um, so this is, a, this is of course a function of z. So this is an example of what you're seeing in some of the other lectures in auxiliary construction, and the whole point is that you treat the aij as unknowns. In, uh, so unknown, say, in the ring of integers of your field that you've set up in the statement of the, of the theorem. So then there is a theorem in effective linear algebra called Siegel's lemma, which is an important tool uh, not only in transcendence proofs but also in uh, Diophantine approximation proofs. And so what you do is you... The idea is you're going to choose your unknowns such that this function vanishes to high order at lots of points w. So um, there are going to be l, uh, sorry, uh, m points w, and there's going to be have, you're going to ask for vanishing up to order n. And one of the arts of transcendence is that you start off with parameters 
which are unspecified, and then uh, you have to choose them extremely carefully in order to uh, get a contradiction at the end. So uh, if you put R squared equal to 2 and M, then there are twice as many um, unknowns as equations. So the system is underdetermined. So, there, so this gives you an underdetermined system of linear equations in the AIJ, so you can certainly solve it. And Siegel's lemma gives you a, a bound for the arithmetic size of a solution. So the existence of the, of the solution is just a consequence of linear algebra, and the lemma of Siegel says that you can get a solution of the system such that the AIJ aren't too big. So uh, the AIJ are of control size. So in more technical, so I think that's a misspelling. Uh, I don't know anymore. There's two L's or one L. Um, so, so more technically, we'd say that we have a bound for the height of AIJ. But the numbers are, are not too big, not only uh, in the field in which they sit, but all of their Galois images are also not too big. Okay. okay, so that's your auxiliary construction. And then because your functions are algebraically uh, independent, uh, you can't have an infinite amount of, of vanishing at a point, so there's going to be some s greater than or equal to n, such that eventually this derivative will not vanish, and this will give you a non-zero algebraic number. Okay, and it's crucial that this be not equal to zero. And uh, in the generalizations of this type of argument, this is actually the hard step, is to find an appropriate number which is not equal to zero. Okay, so, um, so because it's not equal to zero, you have an arithmetic lower bound, which tells you that log of the absolute value of alpha is bounded below by the degree of the field times the size of alpha, which is really its, its height. So I'm not going to give the precise definition. So, so here it's essential that alpha be not equal to zero. And then you have an analytic upper bound, which says, uh, uses the maximum modulus uh, principle in a clever way uh, and it says that well um, alpha is a, a value which is not equal to, to zero but at this point you have a lot of vanishing so alpha has to be small so uh, log alpha is small and then you choose your uh, r m n n such that these two bounds are contradictory And then you conclude that, uh, that whatever you were trying to show was transcendental is transcendental because your starting assumption was that uh, this quantity was, was algebraic. So in other words, you, you, deduce that, uh, you deduce that there can't be an infinite number of these uh, WL um, such that this fun these functions all take uh, values in uh, a number field. Okay. So that's sort of a very... Uh, Squashed down proof um, of the Schneider lane, but that's the the idea. So one of the corollaries, which I believe was mentioned this morning, is a uh, result of um, Schneider on uh, the elliptic modular function. So I'm not going to actually go through why it's a corollary of the Schneider lane, but uh, basically in the Functions that you work with are, um, are the bias class elliptic functions in the, uh, in, in, in the Schneider Lane um, criterion. So I'm just going to talk about the result. So, um, so let me recall what the modular function is. So it's a function on the upper half plane with values in the complex numbers, which is holomorphic on H, but it has a pole at infinity, 
Uh, so I'll come to that in a minute, but its main property is that it's invariant under the action of SL2Z. So it's um, so j so j j of this equals j of this. So it's invariant, and of course that's why it's called modular. Okay, and uh, in particular, uh, j of tau plus one is equal to j of tau because tau goes to goes to tau plus one is. Um, such a transformation for the appropriate choice of ABCD. So it has a Fourier expansion, and you can normalize the function uniquely by giving the first two terms in its Fourier expansion. And as, as already a lot of you will have met this function, of course, and the an are uh, all positive integers, which have an interesting interpretation in uh, representation uh, theory of the uh, monster group and so on. And so, for example, a1 is 196884 and so on. So uh, these are known up to, uh, up to large m. So... Um, so the result is so the is that uh, we're going to associate to this function um, something that I'll be calling in these lectures uh, the exceptional set. So it's the set of numbers with positive imaginary part, which are algebraic and such that j of tau is algebraic. Now, once you have a nice uh, transcendental function which is normalized appropriately, you expect that at most algebraic points it's going to be transcendental. And that's the thing that you're usually trying to prove. So this is kind of asking the same question, but phrasing it in terms of algebraic numbers. What are the exceptional guys? So what are the algebraic uh, tau such that uh, j of tau is algebraic? And uh, the result of Schneider is that this is exactly the points in the upper half plane that are quadratic. So the algebraic numbers which are quadratic. So, um, so I think uh, as I think I mentioned yesterday that these are precisely of course the elements of the upper half plane such that uh, this elliptic curve has complex modification. So tau actually um, um, maps q plus q tau to itself. And of course, uh, it's because of this that uh, it's quadratic. Okay, so so the um, the values, so the special, uh, so the this is saying when, when tau is algebraic and not a CM point, then J of tau is transcendental. So it is a transcendence result. And this is a consequence of the schneider lane um, theorem. So what you do is you work with the functions. Uh, so this is the Weierstrass function, I hope, consistent with the notation that's been being used. And uh, you're going to uh, use the Schneider Lane uh, machine. Uh, so you're going to assume that uh, tau is algebraic and that your corresponding elliptic curve is defined over Q bar, which is the same thing as saying that J, that J of tau is algebraic. And then you're going to use the Schneider Lane to deduce that. Uh, these two functions are algebraically dependent, and that can only happen uh, if you have complex multiplication, as, 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 as you can check. So it's a consequence of the, of the Schneider lane. So 
So you can look at this another way. So let's look at this another way. So assume we have two numbers, tau and j tau, which are algebraic. And as I said, this means that um, uh, if I look at uh, this complex torus, this is isomorphic to uh, the complex points on an elliptic curve which has associated equation with a G2 and G3 in the field generated by J of tau. So in, in particular, the elliptic curve is uh, defined over Q bar. So let's look now at um, the product of E with itself. And uh, so this has a, a uniformization uh, by C plus C. And um, the map from here to here is uh, called the exponential map and is given in terms of uh, Weierstrass functions. So let me call it X. So it's a generalization of the exponential map in the usual case. And let me take the subspace of C squared consisting of the points Z1, Z2, such that Z1 minus tau Z2 is equal to zero. So this is a, a subspace um, defined by equations with algebraic coefficients because we've assumed that tau is in Q bar. So we can take um, the exponential, the image under the exponential of this subspace, and that will be uh, an analytic subgroup, H. And we say that such an analytic uh, subgroup is defined over Q bar uh, because it's coming from a subspace of the tangent space defined over Q bar. So suppose that we knew that this is not only analytic, but it's also a connected algebraic group. There's no, there's no reason for that to be uh, true in general. Um, so we have an analytic uh, subgroup, and suppose we knew that for some reason this was an algebraic subgroup. Then it's going to actually correspond to a... Uh, so, so there aren't all that many... Uh, choices for the uh, um, proper algebraic subgroups of E cross E. So you have either it's going to be E cross the zero or a zero cross E or some kind of diagonal embedding of E. So, so what you do is you notice that this, um, uh, this space contains um, a very nice point, namely um, these invariants correspond to another description up to isomorphism of, of your elliptic curve where uh, the generators that you take of the, of the lattice uh, are going to be uh, different numbers to these. And the relation uh, between this and this is that tau will be equal to omega 2 over omega 1. So you get from this lattice to this one by multiplying by the lattice by omega 1. So there's a nice point in, in W, namely, uh, let me get this the right way around, omega 2, omega 1 is in W. And in particular, so are all the, um, the rational multiples at this point. So um, this connected algebraic subgroup of E cross E contains uh, lots of points coming from W that are algebraic points. So um, H contains elements of E cross E Q bar coming from W. Well, I mean, all of the points of H come from 
So in particular, as these numbers are not equal to zero, uh, if you look at the um, so so if so this uh, this connected algebraic subgroup cannot be e cross zero or zero cross e. So what has to happen is that H is isogenous to E, and uh, the projection the projections from H to the two uh, factors of E cross E are going to be in fact be isogenous. So um, so this uh, H is diagonally embedded in E cross E. So this means that. Um, this equation is giving you the uh, equation of an embedded elliptic curve, and precisely what uh, is happening is that your h is corresponding to the graph of uh, uh, P2 composed with P1 inverse, if these are my projections onto the two factors. So in other words, um, tau is simply the... Um, uh, tau has to be an endomorphism because P1 inverse P2 is going to be in the endomorphism algebra and basically um, um, this H is going to be giving you the graph of the corresponding endomorphism which is given by tau. So tau is an element of the endomorphism algebra of E. So we have CM. So instead of using the schneider lane we have to convince ourselves that a certain analytic subgroup is algebraic. So, um, so this has been no it's been known for uh, at least uh, for, uh, forty years. Uh, people in in transcendence have been um, formulating uh, results in transcendence in terms of a criterion for an analytic subgroup of a Lie group to be algebraic. And many people have worked on this, uh, in particular. Um, uh, Professor Goldschmidt has done important work on this, and uh, Bronnewell, who is here in spirit, also did uh, important work on this. Um, uh, and Lang and Bombieri, Nesterenko, Massa. So I want to, in particular, mention an important paper uh, of uh, Michel Goldschmidt. So which I'll, I'll call him W, and I hope there's no confusion as to which W I'm referring to. So. Um, so he has a paper subgroup analytic to group subgroup uh, subgroup analytic to group subgroup of the two. And this is in the Annals of Math uh, 117 in 1983, uh, pages 627 to 657, and in particular theorem 1.1. And this uh, is a theorem which is used in many applications of this type of idea. It's a very uh, important paper. So uh, many people worked on this, and um, um, Following the, the work of, of many people, uh, uh, there was a paper of uh, Wusthold's. Uh, so I give the reference in the in the notes, which essentially gave uh, the optimal uh, result of this type that people were looking for. So, um, so what does this theorem say? So let G be a connected. commutative algebraic group defined over Q bar. So the uh, tangent space at the origin uh, to this group has a natural uh, Q bar structure uh, because it's the, it's the it's defined in terms of the invariant uh, 
de derivation, so you can put a, a Q-bar structure on it. And so let A be an analytic subgroup. of um, the complex points of G. So if you're not so familiar with um, this type of language, you can think of it, so for most applications, what happens is it's actually the image of uh, a parameter space of dimension D. So this is called a D parameter subgroup. So uh, there's absolutely no reason why this image should be algebraic. There's no reason. In fact, there's lots of examples where uh, analytic uh, subgroup is not um, algebraic. So you're looking for a criterion for um, this to be algebraic. And the criteria basically say, uh, says that the analytic uh, subgroup has to contain um, algebraic points. So um, let's say that A uh, is defined over Q bar if its Lie algebra is defined over Q bar as a vector space. So that was the case, for example, um, uh, that was the case, for example, here, uh, because we assumed that tau was uh, an algebraic number. So uh, the theorem says that an analytic subgroup defined over Q bar contains a non-trivial algebraic subgroup defined over Q bar if and only if it contains a non-trivial Uh, point in uh, GQ bar. So as long as you know that, uh, so uh, you may say, well, this is not actually saying it's algebraic, it's saying it contains an algebraic. Uh, but what you can do is, um, if you're looking at a point whose image, so you're looking at a point in the tangent space whose image is algebraic, then you can just go down to the smallest uh, subspace defined over Q bar, uh, the smaller subspace defined over Q bar containing that point. And then you know that that uh, subspace will be the tangent space of an algebraic subgroup. So you can kind of take the minimal guy. So, sort of, so you, you can um, actually turn the contains in practice, the contains uh, um, actually turns out in practice to actually be the analytic subgroup A. So I don't have time to go into the proof of this. I have a, a little summary of the proof uh, in my notes. And so you may say, well, where did the transcendence go? It seems that um, you know we're kind of able to get around it uh, using this uh, result of, of Hustholz or, or the results of um, Goldschmidt. Uh, so the point is that, um, and this is an interesting, I think, uh, problem in its own right, is that the proof is transcendental. So, um, so this is in disguise a statement in transcendence, and the proof uses um, techniques which are similar in spirit to the proof of the Schneider lane. They're infinitely more complicated and difficult, but they're similar. They're similar in spirit to the proof of the Schneider lane theorem. So that's where the transcendence went. 
Okay, so um, so one consequence of this theorem is that uh, all Q bar linear relations between periods on uh, so I'm going to say just to simplify a uh, simple abelian variety come from endomorphisms. So they come from endomorphisms of the abelian variety. So why is that? Well, the Cuba, so I don't have time to explain in detail, but the Cuba linear relation. So say you have one such, that's going to correspond to uh, a subspace uh, of the tangent space. So if you have a linear relation between two things, it's a subspace of the tangent space of the abelian variety squared. If you have a subspace, if you have a relation between uh, n things, then it's going to be a, a subspace of the tangent space of a to the m. So of a power of a. And if it's a linear relation with coefficients in q bar, then w is going to be defined over q bar. And um, the periods, so the periods will give rise to um, an algebraic point on uh, this power of the abelian variety. So the theorem of Wurstholz is going to tell you that um, W is actually corresponding to um, By the exponential map is corresponding to an algebraic subgroup of a power of a. And once again, there aren't that, I mean, once you have an algebraic subgroup of a power of a, its defining equations in the tangent space are going to have co coefficients which are endomorphisms. Otherwise, otherwise, it's not going to be an algebraic uh, subgroup. So it's a little bit like if you're looking at a, at a torus, say g m to the r, and you want to look at the algebraic subgroups, then they're, they're the things of the form x1 to the b1, x2 to the b2, up to xr to the br equals 1, for some integers b1, b2 through br. So similarly, um, this tangent space, if there were no endomorphisms at all, it would have to be definable by um, by uh, um, equations with coefficients in the integers. But in general, there'll be endomorphisms, so you can allow it also to have uh, its coefficients in the endomorphisms. And so that will tell you that the relation that you have between the periods are in fact coming from endomorphisms on the Abelian variety. So, um, okay. So, in a similar spirit, if you uh, take two different abelian ver varieties that have uh, uh, periods in common, then uh, these abelian varieties have to share, uh, up to isogeny, they have to share a a simple factor. So there are simple factors of A1 of A and, and B1 of B such that A1 is isogenous to B1. So the only way that you're going to get a relation between uh, the periods on uh, different abelian varieties is if they have uh, some factors which are isogenous on them. So it's the same argument. Okay, so uh, I'm behind. Um, But it's okay, so I'll, uh, uh, I'm only get as far as uh, part four. So, 
So I want to go back to the picture in higher dimension that we had in the first lecture. So you remember uh, that we had um, the Siegel um, space. And so now our, our points are matrices and we had the action of this, uh, this group, which is the analog of SL2Z. And the orbit space was the Siegel modular variety, AG. So the uh, abelian varieties of dimension G defined over Q bar correspond to the algebraic points of the variety. Um, that's similar to having the J value uh, an algebraic number. It turns out also that the uh, CM abelian varieties correspond to uh, a point in the Siegel space, which is a matrix all of whose entries are algebraic. And that's exactly the analog of having tau algebraic, which is certainly true in the CM case. So that's um, that's something that uh, that is known from the theory of complex multiplication. And so the Z is, uh, is an algebraic matrix, and moreover, uh, the CM guys are defined of the Q bar. So they correspond to uh, points in the Siegel space, that are matrices with entries in Cuba, and they correspond to points on the Siegel modular variety, uh, which are algebraic. So you can ask the same question as in uh, the result of Schneider, is, are these the only points for which this happens? And this is a, a theorem of myself with uh, Shiga and Wolfart. So, uh, so suppose you have a map so this is the analog of the J function. So you have a, a holomorphic modular function. So now it has to be SP2GZ invariant. And then you have to normalize it uh, in some way in order to do a transcendence. So it's enough uh, to ask that Jz is uh, algebraic for all Cm Z. So in other words, C to the G over Z to the G plus Z, Z to the G is an abelian variety with complex multiplication. Then uh, the result says that this is the only, only point for which this happens. So if I look at this function and I ask for all such exceptional values. Then this set consists exactly of uh, the CM points in the sense that, um, so if this is AZ, in the sense that AZ has CM. So you can do the, uh, the analog of um, this consequence of, uh, of schneider lang So um, the last 10 minutes, which are rapidly evaporating, I was going to give uh, an idea of the proof. So let me, instead of giving it let me give it just in a little corner. So um, your z is the ratio. So it's omega 2 over omega 1, only now your omega 2 and omega 1 are matrices. And these are matrices uh, whose coefficients are 
periods of differential forms defined over Q bar, as I said in the first lecture. So you multiply both sides by big omega 1. And then if your z is uh, algebraic, you have a matrix whose entries are periods on this side and a matrix whose entries are periods on this side, and z is giving you a linear relation between them. So the theorem of Wusthold says that you have to have some non-trivial endomorphisms. So if the endomorphism algebra of A was... So this tells you the endomorphism algebra of A can't just be the trivial one. It can't be Q. But your problem is, in order to have complex multiplication, you have to have lots and lots of endomorphisms. So you have to have a better argument than this in order to show that there are enough endomorphisms to give you complex multiplication. And um, that involves going uh, into the um, details in Shimura's papers uh, on the construction of Shimura varieties of the PEL type. But the gist of it is that um, you work instead of with Z, uh, with a Z associated to a Shimura variety for which, um, which corresponds exactly to the endomorphs in algebra of A. So, And then you show that you have one extra guy, which is a contradiction, unless you're in the CM case. So it's quite a long story, and I won't I won't have time to to go into the into the details. But that's kind of the the the, the idea. So it uses Wusthold's uh, result. So I want instead to talk about something else. Um, so you have this exceptional set of points in the Siegel space, uh, where uh, which are algebraic and whose uh, J value is algebraic. So you can look at the image of these points in AG, and that gives you a, a set E bar. And so it's natural to, to want to know how these E bar are distributed. So, uh, so one can conjecture the following. So let Z be an irreducible algebraic subvariety of. AG, then you can ask the following, when is this as a risky dense set, so this is a risky dense, and um, the reasonable thing to conjecture is that this is a risky dense if and only if Z is what's called a special and the way to think of that, uh, since I don't have time to explain the uh, true meaning, is that it's uh, a Shimura subvariety. It's actually an irreducible component of a Shimura subvariety or its image under a Hecker operator. So what does that mean? That means that it's, it is itself a, a moduli space for a family. Of a billion varieties with some extra structure. So, because you have extra structure, you don't get all of the Siegel modular um, variety, but some sub variety. So, um, by our theorem, uh, E bar is actually equivalent to the CM points. And so if you write instead of E bar, if you write complex multiplication points, this is actually a, a well-known um, conjecture of Andre and Ort that they made independently uh, about 20 years ago uh, for completely different reasons. Um, and a lot, of a lot of work has been done on this, and uh, in particular there is uh, now an announcement uh, of a result by Klingler uh, Yafayev, and I believe they use work of Ummo, which says that this is a consequence of the generalized Riemann hypothesis. 
So we'll, we'll have occasion to come back to this conjecture uh, in uh, our discussion of hypergeometric functions. And there we're, uh, we're fortunate because we're going to need a particular case of the Andre Ork conjecture in the case when z is a curve that doesn't depend on the Riemann hypothesis. So um, there's a slightly weaker conjecture that you can make um, uh, which, which, you know, for, for which there are results that don't depend on, on, on the Riemann hypothesis. So I'll sort of ask, I haven't been able to, I don't know if anyone knows uh, amongst people, people in the audience interested in this, I haven't actually been able to find the manuscript, even though this has been announced now since 2006. I don't know if anyone, so if anyone has seen uh, a manuscript, if you, an official manuscript. I have an old version that was sent to me by Yafeyev, 2006, sort of a, like a preprint, and um, then apparently there were two names associated to this, and then I saw three names associated to this, but I haven't actually been able to uh, find a manuscript, but I believe he spoke about this in the Journal of Arithmetic in 2007. So, um, so that's, that's it. <laughs>